comrades and friends, compañeras and compañeros. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mexican, uh, born in Stolen, Mexico, which means I was born in Texas. And uh, the uh, issue of immigration, as you all know, is very much part of Mexican people's DNA, no matter what side of the uh, border you're, uh, you're born in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about immigration uh, and also because I'm still very much mourning the loss of my comrade Fidel Castro and still groping uh, and trying to deal with the world where Fidel is gone and Trump is in power. Uh, I'm going to use that to sort of talk about why I am so optimistic about the need to build unity and the potential for a whole new period in this country. So uh, as you all know, or maybe you don't, but in 2006, under the presidency of George W. Bush, the current war against migrants in the US began. And it had not only, of course, a vicious anti-worker component, but it was a racist one as well. And it was founded in the ideology that America was becoming too brown and too black. Now, for new folks, America is not a formulation our party nor the movement uses. America is a continent, not a country. Uh, so, but I wanted to repeat that because that's the way the ideology was promoted at the time. Uh, Samuel Huntington from Harvard wrote this whole thesis about how uh, America is becoming too black and brown because of immigration. Uh, was his argument that the very fabric of the country was uh, in danger. So that was, you know, the racist component of what happened in 2006. So legislation was passed in that period, or they attempted to pass it, that would further criminalize and demonize the 12 to 14 undocumented people in this country. So even though it was the beginning of the current war against immigrants, it was certainly the beginning of the resistance as well. As we remember in 06, uh, millions of, of uh, immigrant workers took to the streets in the millions, not just once, but several times that year. Everybody was chanting, si se puede. It was just a wonderful, wonderful time. Now, who, who knew then that George W. Bush would look like a moderate years later compared to Donald Trump? I'm saying looked, wasn't, but looked like a moderate compared to Trump. Because the election of Trump has galvanized extreme anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and racist forces. He has become a magnet for the most reactionary and backward elements in society. That Breitbart, Stephen Bannon, is in the White House alone chills me. But Trump's administration of white supremacists threatens all workers, whether they know it or not. And most interesting is that liberals are also feeling threatened as they fear that their precious perceived democratic institutions are in jeopardy. And that's interesting to see that. And how does the left use and take advantage of this? Because sometimes you gotta work with liberals. You just gotta if you wanna win. Uh, and plus they have money sometimes. Um, but it doesn't determine our politics. Just make that clear. Uh, most interest. So after Trump's uh, debacle with Mexico, in his first short week in office, we can assume that even elements among the ruling class, I'm talking about the super rich, are also worried about a Trump administration, which I will explain. But given all this, comrades and friends, we are proposing here today that all this presents not conditions for gloom and doom, but just the opposite, which is easier to say after January 20th and 21st, right? That wasn't so easy to say on January the 19th. The election of Trump, a pathological liar, a narcissist, a misogynist, a moronic, 
pussy grabbing craven bully might be just what Lenin ordered. <laughs> because Trump's election has ushered in a new period of resistance. And I, for one, am elated. It's a sea change. When I went to that women's demo last Saturday, which was, uh, yes, primarily white, I couldn't believe how many white folks had signs, homemade signs, about the immigrant struggle, about um, Muslim solidarity. I couldn't believe it. I was in tears. I was in tears. Now, maybe after you sit and talk to them for a while, they'll get on your nerves because they start using the wrong language and stuff like that. But, you know, like Monica says, we take them along. And I want to also just go on record that even though I'm focusing on immigration, I want to go on record and saying that there is no struggle in the United States that not, is not linked to the struggle with the black community. And you cannot have liberation of, of immigrants or anyone without not just without not just showing solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement by but by supporting the black liberation struggle. All those liberals who were talking at who were at some point talking about the electoral electoral college should know. The electoral college was formed because of, of racism and because of the South. Your struggle is linked to the liberation of the black struggle. And these liberals got to get with it if they're going to win. And so how wonderful if all of this, if what is happening at JFK right now, where people are going to that demonstration to JFK to protest what Trump signed yesterday, how wonderful if the wall becomes the very thing that crushes Trump. Yeah. It could be the period. It could be the period we st where we stop the deportations. We actually stop them because that's what I'm hearing from the movement in Texas, that they're going to go and actually stop deportations. Undocumented workers could win legalization if they want it. If they don't want it, they have every right to be here with full rights. And what if the movement continues to the point of stopping not only the Trump attacks, but raises class consciousness, like Monica was arguing, to a whole new revolutionary level? We think this can happen. And here are some examples why. This week, a shitstorm of U.S. international diplomatic relations hit the fan. On day six, Trump signed the executive order on border security and immigration enforcement improvements. To fulfill a campaign promise, Trump instructed the Department of Homeland Security to commence immediate construction of the 1900 mile long wall along the border with Mexico using existing federal funds. This is supposed to cost $20 billion. And make no mistake it, about it. Under Clinton, Obama, uh, Bush, this border has been militarized and strengthened more every year. It is, it is a military area already. The famous goddamn friggin' wall <laughs> that was a cornerstone of his campaign was ordered to be built this week. And at the signing, Trump said for the millionth time that he would get Mexico to pay for that wall. The executive order was being signed at the very same time that a delegation representing the Mexican government was in D.C. in preparation for a visit from Mexico's president next week. The signing of the executive order before the bilateral two-nation meeting insulted Mexico and threw those preparations into chaos. The pressure to defend Mexico's sovereignty and for the Mexican government to do everything it could to make it look as if Mexico was not a puppet of U.S. imperialism was on. The president, Enrique Peña, Nieto declared that he would not be coming to the U.S. next week after all and reiterated forcefully that Mexico would not pay for that damn wall. You can't trust what they say though. <laughs> Trump, of course, ever the man-child, said that he and Peña Nieto had decided together to cancel the meeting and that as long, right, he was lying, and that as long as Mexico did not respect or treat the U.S. fairly, there would be no meeting. 
Now, why do I say that elements of the ruling class may be worried about a Trump administration? Because there's no way in hell that the capitalist class, that the ruling class will allow Trump to derail their long-standing relationship with Mexico. Mexico is a third world country. Despite its many riches, it is not a developed first world country. It is a country whose capitalist government is beholden to the U.S. because it too gains tremendous riches from exploiting the Mexican people. One of the most uh, richest people in the world is Carlos Slim from Mexico. Trump can say what he wants, but the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. will never be a fair or equal one as long as one is an oppressed nation and the other is the vile oppressor. There are 11 U.S. banks that do business in Mexico. They have a combined $96 billion in cross-border claims. Citigroup alone has $65 billion invested in Mexico. Walmart, Apple, GE, J.P. Morgan, General Motors are just some of the multinational corporations who operate in Mexico. Do you think they want the relationship endangered by a Trump administration? Of course not. They want to do business unfettered with Mexico. This is why, one of the reasons why Trump is a danger to the ruling class. Trump's tirades have put fuel in the fires in Mexico. By saying that he wants to punish Mexico by raising tariffs so that this can pay for the wall, he challenges Mexico's independence from the gringos. He says that he will make it hard for, Mex for Mexicans living in the U.S. to send remittances to Mexico, which can potentially create an even more critical economic crisis in that country. He insults Mexico and jeopardizes the president of Mexico's relationship with the people, stirring up anti-Yankee sentiments that can easily turn into mass rebellions against the Mexican government. Of course, Trump doesn't know any of this because he's never written, read, a, he's never written or read a damn book. <laughs> but Economies 101 Trump, a dire economic crisis can easily create revolutionary fires. And Mexico is ripe for revolutionary change. The Mexican government could be toppled over any moment. And in fact, were it not for the billions that the US sends Mexico under the guise of fighting drugs under Plan Merida, those billions are actually used to train the police and Mexican military for repression against the movement. But it could be rising fuel cost, or the case of the Ayotzinapa 43, or the boiling anger from the decades of repression and murder and disappearances paid and orchestrated by the U.S. that finally all merge into a revolutionary insurrection. We don't know when. We don't know what will cause it, but we know that it's going to happen in Mexico. And the only reason why it hasn't happened is because of the U.S. In, a penetration in there, because it's right there at our bo a border. So sooner or later, Trump's going to, Wall Street is going to have to tap Trump on the shoulder and say, shut up. You're stirring, or you're stirring up things way too much. Now, we don't want, I, I give Trump a year. Frankly, I think somebody's going to, something. But we don't want Pence either, because Pence is worse. I mean, Pence is the first vice president in 40 plus years that spoke to a rally yesterday. Uh, a right to life, which means the right to kill rally yesterday. And so we don't want a Pence administration either. And this is why the struggle against the Trump administration period is so important. And why the struggle is against the ruling class is so important. Now, when I say that things are changing here, and I'm going to end with this, in 1994, uh, as part of the International Action Center, we went to Chiapas with Ramsey Clark, some human rights activists, and some journalists, and we had a delegation that went to Chiapas to support the Zapatistas. And we were there, 
And Ramsey and our delegation was going to have a press conference at a little nice hotel, and he was going to speak as a former U.S. Attorney General who he has sided with the people. He broke with the government, and an, an example where you can work with the really good liberals because Ramsey Clark is one of those that broke from the system. Former U.S. Attorney General speaking on behalf of the people, and the government turns off the sound at this event. And the journalists, all the Mexican journalists started chanting, sonido, sonido, you know, sound. demanding the sound. And I'm like, oh shit, man, you know, the journalists in in U.S. would never do that. They would never do that. But you know what? They're starting to do that just a tiny bit. I mean, who would ever think that, I don't know how to say his name, the Anzir Ansari, the South Asian brother? What? No, the the comedian, the South Asian comedian, him, he he moderated SNL last Saturday, and he gave a very a little bit mixed up on the black question, but he gave a very anti-racist comment. A talk. His whole monologue was printed in the New York Times. Now, I'm not saying that New York Times or any of this is revolutionary. I'm just sort of giving little samples in the popular culture that show that things are, are, are changing. When people who have never gone to demonstrations, who used to think that the fact that I went to demonstrations, that I was doing work with the devil, or that the government was going to kill me right then and there, you know, were so afraid. The idea of going to a demo was so frightening. To to them, they're coming to demos right now. And they're not where we're at. They're at a different place. But like Monica sp spoke so eloquently, we can take them to another place. And we can lead a united front to defeat the Trump agenda. And then the smaller cadre, we will find those smaller elements of revolutionary vanguard youth. Because it's a new period. It started with 2006, with the rise of the immigrant people. It went on to occupied Wall Street. And we could share all kinds of experiences with the occupied Wall Street. And then it went on to the Black Lives Matter movement. And what's going to be wonderful is if all those struggles could unite together, march it together, a united front against Trump. And, and that we are confident. We are confident that it's going to happen. And we might even see a May Day this year, similar to what happened on January 21st. We can't let the liberals control the message of May Day. Let's make May Day a working class, revolutionary uh, uh, um, event. And I'm going to end with that. All power to the youth, all power to the people, socialism or death. Thank you. Yeah.